Hello students of Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker with another video in the Newtonian Kinetics chapter. Today we're going to talk about rigid body translation and how we can apply our fundamental equations to translating bodies. So if we have translation, now keep in mind that translation has two different forms. We can either have linear translation or we can have curvilinear translation. Now, linear is just as it sounds. If we had, say, a surface and we had a block on this surface and we were accelerating this block up this ramp, um, that's just going to be linear motion, right? It's going to move in a straight line going up that ramp. Now, curvilinear can be a little bit more complicated. Let's say that we have a system with two fixed axis arms. Let's draw a wire diagram here. So there's a pin. Here's a pin. And we have a body in between here that also is pinned. So let's call this O, A, B, and C. So O and C are fixed axis pins. And A, B is, it turns out to be in curvilinear translation. Now, I'm going to try to grab a hold of it here and see what happens if I can move it around. So as this swings around, basically as you get a circular motion of both uh, a and B around points O and C, this body here will not rotate. It will just translate, right? It'll translate in a circle around and around and around like that. So we call that curvilinear translation. And it turns out to have the exact same relationships, the exact same fundamentally equations. Now, the only thing that curvilinear picks up it, that linear doesn't is we do have a normal acceleration not equal to zero for curvilinear. Okay, and that's because normal acceleration is based upon a linear velocity. We basically can use that a n is equal to v squared over a radius of curvature. We often use rho. We could also use r, but that's to be true for curvilinear. Where for our linear, our a n is going to equal zero. Okay, so other details for translation in general is that our omega, angular velocity, has to equal zero, and our angular acceleration, alpha, must also equal zero. Okay, so if the body is not rotating, it has no angular velocity, it also has no angular acceleration, therefore those both go to zero. So looking at our fundamental equations, uh, in, if you watch my previous videos, you'll see that for forces, we could say sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. Now on this one, I'm going to talk about kind of acceleration um, parallel to the motion of the system. So that would be analogous. This would be my acceleration parallel. And then perpendicular would be going perpendicular up this way. So we could label that one acceleration perpendicular to the motion. And I hope you can see that all of the acceleration is going to be parallel. And this perpendicular term is going to go to zero as we take a look at it. So coming back to my equations here, um, orthogonal equations, one in the parallel direction, one in the perpendicular direction. I guess I should go ahead and label F parallel and F perpendicular. And as I mentioned, this acceleration perpendicular is going to go to zero, at least for linear motion, but not curvilinear. And so really, this bottom equation is going to simplify to sum of forces in a perpendicular direction is equal to zero. So more like a statics equation. And then, of course, the top equation is just going to come over. Sum of forces in the parallel direction is equal mass times acceleration parallel. All right, so there's two of our three equations. As we get into our moment equation, the most general form we could use would be sum of moments about the centroid. The centroid is point G. That is going to equal my mass moment inertia about the centroid times my angular acceleration of the body. Now, we said that omega and alpha were zero. So once again, this will go to zero. And so we're left with the equation sum of moments about the centroid is equal to zero because right, zero times a non-zero mass moment of inertia will still be zero. Or, now if you have a single body and you're able to do your computations about the centroid, probably the easiest thing to do, if you have a multiple composite body, which I'll do in an example right after this that has one of those situations, or you need to sum your moments about some point that isn't the centroid, we can use 
our full equation for some point that is not the centroid sum of moments about point P, that's right, this is a vector equation, is equal to my moment inertia about my centroid times the angular acceleration vector plus my kinetic moment term. Kinetic moment term being R of G relative to P as a vector crossed into mass times acceleration of the centroid as a vector. Okay, and keeping in mind that there's a chance we'd need to sum um, the components of that acceleration term. It turns out in this case, we don't need to worry about that because we have all of our acceleration isolated in one direction. But um, again, here we can know that our acceleration, angular acceleration of the body is zero. And so this equation simplifies to sum of moments about point P as a vector is equal to just the kinetic moment term. Okay, the sum of my r of g relative to p as a vector crossed with my mass times my acceleration of my centroid as a vector. Okay, so our equations are the following. We have equation one, equation two, and either equation, call this one 3a or 3b. Okay, so take your pick, choose your own adventure on that last equation. So let's take a look at an example. So on this example, we have a motorcycle. And this motorcycle is made up of both a motorcycle and also the motorcycle's rider. And so we talked about non-centroidal points. This actually has two different centroidal points. One of those for so the rider up here, G2, and then for the motorcycle down here, G1. So G2 is a centroid for the rider, and G1 is a centroid for the motorcycle. So in order to look at the forces, we need a free body diagram. Now I'm going to draw kind of a simplified free body diagram of the motorcycle. There's their motorcycle, and then let's use blue for the rider. So the rider has a helmet and some arms and some legs, something like that. A horrible blob free body diagram and we'll make this our combined free body diagram and kinetic okay so I'll go ahead and do all of my force terms in red and then my acceleration terms or my kinetic terms in purple all right so here are the two centroids we have G sub 1 and then the second centroid point down here G sub 2 so looking at our forces, we have a weight of the rider. Uh, we know that the rider is 75 kilograms, so we multiply that times gravity. So 75 times 9.81 will give me the weight of the rider. Additionally here, we have 125 kilograms of the motorcycle times again, gravitational constant 9.81 gives me the weight of the motorcycle. And we have the back wheel in contact. So we have a normal force, I'll call it N sub B, normal force of the back wheel, it's also point B. Now the front wheel, we'll talk a bit more about this as we move through the problem. The, the front wheel could have a normal force, call this N sub A. And then we have a friction force. If we assume that the front wheel is frictionless, that's gonna roll freely, and that our motor is hooked to the back wheel, which is the standard way motorcycles work, we're gonna have a friction that is going to cause this motorcycle to move, right? They talk about friction opposing motion, but if you think about the direction that this wheel would spin, so the impending motion of that rear wheel would be negative from the right-hand rule, our friction opposing motion turns out to go opposing that direction, call this F sub B. And so that friction is actually causing the motorcycle to move forward. Okay, so that's my free body diagram. Let's add my kinetic terms. I have acceleration here, A bar of the motorcycle rider, we'll call that A bar one. Now, here is my A bar two. Now, if the rider is going to stay on the motorcycle and is going to stay in the relative same position, then we also know that A bar one is going to equal A bar two. Okay, so we're really just dealing with one single acceleration term and that's gonna be in the X direction. Okay, so like an A bar in the X for both the motorcycle and also the rider. All right, that kind of frames the overall problem. The last thing I wanna take a look at is this normal force on the front wheel. 
This is a key part right here without popping a wheelie. Okay, and so essentially that normal force on the front wheel is going to go to zero as this motorcycle almost pops a wheelie. So the motorcycle is not going to rotate. It is just going to accelerate so quickly that the front wheel is now not touching the ground but has not actually lifted off the ground. Okay, I know that's kind of a, a fine point there. And we'll go ahead and use a standard X, Y coordinate system for this problem. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our equations. So starting with our force equation, I'm going to start with the sum of forces in the Y direction, in that perpendicular direction, just because I know I'm going to have no acceleration in that direction. And it's going to give me some information to find my normal force. So sum of forces in the Y is equal to mass times my acceleration in the Y direction. We know that there is no motion perpendicular to the road in the vertical direction, so that acceleration will go to zero. So now, summing my forces, I have a force N sub B, which is positive going upward from the rear wheel. I additionally have two weight forces, so the weight of the rider, 75 times 9.81, and then the weight of the motorcycle, 125 kilograms times 9.81. Let's see, no other forces vertical. So this then will equal uh, zero, okay? So my N sub B must be equal to the sum of my weights or 1,962 newtons for the overall um, force on the rear wheel, vertical force. So we're gonna solve for two different things in this problem. One of them is going to be the maximum acceleration, maximum linear acceleration, A sub X. And then also the amount of friction coefficient to make sure that rear wheel doesn't slip. Okay, so we are assuming we're gonna reach impending motion friction as this motorcycle accelerates forwards. So keeping those two things in mind, summing forces in the X direction, we only have one force in the X direction. And that force is going to be my force F sub B. And that's going to equal, now the mass here is going to be the sum of the masses. We're treating this as an overall system. So 75 kilograms plus 125 kilograms. And that will be times my unknown acceleration, A sub X. Now, because we're at impending motion friction, we can actually substitute here F equals mu sub S times N. And so our unknown mu sub S, and then our N sub B, because we're talking about the friction there on the rear wheel. Now, there may be some problems where you could solve a translational problem with just force equations. It really depends on your equations and unknowns. If we take a look here, we still have an unknown a sub x, and we still have an unknown mu sub s. And essentially, in these, um, the, the, the top equation, the y equation, just came in to give us the value for n sub b. Okay? So I still have two equations with one unknown. So we do need to sum our moments. And we need to sum moments, and we could pick whatever point that we liked. We could pick one of the centroids, but then we'd still need the kinetic moment term for the other centroid. I decided on this problem to actually pick point B back here on the back wheel of the bike. So we're going to sum our moments at point B. This is going to equal, we're at the full equation here, I bar times alpha as a vector plus my kinetic moment term. So the sum, the summation, of my R of G relative to the point. So this in case is gonna be point B. And I could write this if I wanted to G sub I, right? I have two different centroid points. We'll see that we'll have two different cross products come out of this. We're gonna cross that with the mass of each individual body times the acceleration as a vector of each body, which those are gonna be the same. So summing my moments, I have no moments coming from either NB or FB because they're going right through point B. The only moments I'll have are from my weight forces. And so from those weight forces, I have a distance over to the rider's weight of 0 0.4 meters times that weight was 75 times 9.81 meters per second squared. And that's negative from the right-hand rule. All right, taking a look at that distance, I'm talking about going horizontally over here into the line of action of this force. And so I cross this R into the F coming downwards, and so I get negative from the right-hand rule. Moving on to my other weight force, I have a, I have a distance of, let's see, 0.4 plus 0.4, 0 0.8 meters 
times 125 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. This also is negative from the right-hand rule. Okay, so that takes care of everything on the left-hand side, the sum of my moments about point B. On the right, I have the distances up to the acceleration. Okay, so on this one, I need to find a distance from B up to now the line of action of this acceleration force is there, and then the same thing up to the line of action of my G2 acceleration is there. So writing out those cross products, we have a distance vertically of 0 0.6 meters up to the motorcycle's centroid. The mass of the motorcycle is 125 kilograms. It has an acceleration of a sub x. That moment is also negative from the right-hand rule, right? That kinetic moment taking my r distance upwards cross into my acceleration going to the right, fundamentally a j hat into an i hat, gives me a negative k hat. And then my last term here is going to be for the rider, uh, a distance again of 0 0.9 meters, 0 0.6 plus 0.3, 75 is the mass, and then an unknown acceleration a sub x. This is also negative from the right-hand rule. Now it turned out in this problem, all of the terms had negative cross products. That's okay, we could actually multiply the whole equation by negative one if you wanted to, uh, to get rid of those. But from this equation here, we picked up just a single unknown, which is our a sub x. And so out of this equation, we can solve for a sub x. We find out that a sub x is equal to 8.95 meters per second squared. So nearly the acceleration of gravity that this motorcycle, given the mass, given the geometry, could accelerate nearly as fast as you could drop something in free fall. And then the amount of friction that we would need, basically substituting this a sub x back up into our sum of force in the x equation, is that mu sub s is equal to 0 0.912. Okay, so there are our two values. So a really high coefficient of static friction, nearly one, right? So now this amount of friction is available if you're talking about a very clean road and pretty new tires, you can get up to around 0.9 between uh, rubber and asphalt or concrete, but is requiring a pretty high coefficient of friction without popping a wheelie and also noting without um, spinning the back wheel. Okay, so we haven't entered kinetic friction, which is why we were able to use mu sub s times n. Essentially at that rear wheel contact point, we have static friction as the contact point is not slipping versus the road. Hence is static at that point versus kinetic. So I hope that the overview and also this example gives you a good insight to using these Newtonian kinetics equations for translation. And I hope you're having an awesome day.